quick is we are at capacity, which is awesome. Isn't that awesome? Okay, we are like sold out. But I need you guys to squeeze into the center of every row to make sure every seat is full. We had people sitting on the floor for a mass, and there were empty seats in the crowd. So can you all squeeze in very closely? Okay, so there's no empty seats. So everybody gets a seat. Okay. So what we're going to do right now is going to have you stand up, please. Stand up, stand up, stand up. And we are going to, we're going to talk about relationships today. We're going to talk about a lot of cool things, okay? But we're going to play a little game called Would You Rather, all right? All right, so here you go. I've got uh, four or five questions for you. We're going to go very quickly, all right? Look at me, y'all. Look at me. Here we go. Question number one. You have a choice to use one brush for the rest of your life. Would you rather use a toothbrush or a hairbrush? Okay. So if you would rather use a toothbrush, sit down. If you'd rather use a toothbrush, sit down. Hairbrush people, stay standing. Everybody's moving away from you right now. Okay. All right. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Here we go. Number two. You have to choose one, and notice the word is always, okay? Would you rather always be 10 minutes late or always be 20 minutes early? 10 minutes late, you, you all have come, come disrupted. All right, all you late freaks, sit down. All you late people, have a seat. Oh, you guys are, like, early. <laughs> oh, yeah, I knew I liked you. All right, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. I got two more for you. I've got two more for you. Question number three, here we go. Would you rather, oh, this is a good one. Would you rather lose all of your money and all of your valuables, or would you rather lose all of the pictures you have ever taken? Would you rather lose all of your money and all of your valuables, or would you rather lose every picture you have ever taken? Okay. All right, so if, if money and valuables are very important to you, have a seat. If money and valuables are very important. Oh, that's about half and half. Okay, all right. Stand up, stand up, stand up. All right, so I got two more. Here we go. Question number four. This is interesting. Would you rather... Would you rather be famous when you are alive and forgotten when you die? Or would you rather be unknown while you are alive but famous after you die? Okay. So all... <laughs> I, like that. I don't know, sister. All right, all you people that would rather be famous after you're dead, have a seat, okay? <laughs> okay. All right, and last one, last one, last one. Have a stand up real quick, last one. Last one. Would you rather, would you rather, would you rather have 10 million followers on Instagram or, we're not playing volleyball, can you hold that for a second? 10 million followers on Instagram or would you rather have one loyal true friend for life? A friend that will never leave you, that will love you? 10 million Instagram followers or one true loyal friend that loves the heck out of you your entire life? If you'd rather have one friend for life, have a seat. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so I'm going <laughs> to... Everybody's like hating on you guys that are still standing. Okay, here's what we're going to do. So look at me real quick. Look at me. So we're going to have a, a little general session on relationships, and Rachel's going to come and give us an awesome talk about relationships. What's going to happen at the end of this is, for the last after, at the, after her talk, for 15 minutes, we're going to do a Q&A with you. Okay, so that means you can tweet your questions to Rachel, to Matt Rigetz, who's going to be here, to myself, okay? So you can find us on the screen, so at MC Rigetz, Rachel Leninger, and myself at One Groovy Nun, okay? Listen. If this is going to be distracting to you, don't do it, okay? Because you can live tweet us also during the Q&A. So if it's distracting, don't do it. But if you have a question, ask us. Two other things. Number one, um, 
this is not a time to ask for have to have you ask me how many habits, how many pockets I have in my habit. Okay, we did that last week. There's two. All right, there you go. Don't ask it. Okay, so, but if you have a question about relationships or love or anything like that, you can tweet that to us. Secondly, you must understand we're not going to read your Twitter handle, but if you tweet it out, the world will see it. Okay, so if you want it just directly to us, you must direct message us. I, I know you know how this works, but I want to say that because I know last week some people tweeted stuff out and they're like, oh my gosh, it went out to the world. It will go out to the world unless you direct message us. Okay, so. Please put your hands together and welcome Rachel Leninger to give us a talk on relationships. Here we go. Hello again, my friends. All right, did you know that at the end of this weekend you're going to get a survey where you get to like say how awesome everything was? That's going to happen. Um, you know, do what you need to do. Uh, but last year's survey, the number one thing that Steubenville Conference participants said they wanted more of in the future were talks about relationships. Okay, that was the number one most requested topic for future conferences. So the people asked, we're here to deliver, all right? And so let's just do a quick rundown to get started of what relationships look like in our world in 2018, all right? Anybody listening to Love Is Everything yet? I don't, I haven't, I don't know. But yeah, Carter's dropping an album together, pretty cool. On television, you know, True Love in about two months time, if you're lucky, all right? Also on television, there are the Kardashians. Wow. People got feelings. Okay, yeah. And I know that photo did not even come close. Slow it down for me. Slow it down. Go back. Go back. I want to go back to them for just a second because I know that this is not even close to everyone who is in their whole family tree. I have lost track. I know there's a kid named Chicago. I'm pretty sure she's a girl. Okay, yeah. So, all right, on to our next one. Yes, there he is, John Legend, Arthur himself, uh, with his two children, Luna and a new little boy whose name I don't know. I, I know Luna. That's good. Okay, they just had a new baby. Meghan Markle. That's right. She just made so many of our dreams come true by becoming British royalty. Uh, and did you all know that her father had been invited to the wedding and then he was uninvited to the wedding? Her father was not in attendance, okay? Another one you may not know too much about. This is a guy named Jeff Lewis. He has a TV show on Bravo. It's like one of those design shows. Well, uh, he and his same-sex partner hired a woman to be a surrogate for them so that they could have a child. That's her. Her name is Monroe Christine. And now uh, that woman who served as their surrogate is suing them for defamation of character because on the episode of the TV show when Monroe Christine was born, they said horribly degrading things about this woman and her body. We also have in our country families being separated at the border. We also have... Couples getting divorced, Channing Tatum, Jenna Dewan, they were together almost 10 years, and now they're not. Yep. Or we have people coming together, right? Yeah. Okay, y'all seem to know, but if you don't know, uh, this is Ariana Grande and her new fiance, Saturday Night Live actor Pete Davidson. They have been dating about as long as I have had a current gallon of milk in my refrigerator, and now they are going to get married, so there you go. While we're here to talk about relationships today, I want to be clear that we're not just talking about dating, although of course we're going to talk about dating, okay? But when we talk about relationships, it's not just dating relationships. It's family relationships. It's friendships. It's all of them because we were created for relationships. We're constantly seeking them out because it's such an innate part of who we are. This morning we talked about being created in the image and likeness of God who is himself a relationship, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The father can't be a father, can't be a parent unless he has a child, the son can't be the son unless he has a father, right? And the Holy Spirit is the relationship that exists, the love between the two of them that makes them a relationship. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, three persons in one, we, they are a relationship. And in his image and likeness, we are born into relationships. There is not a person on this planet in the history of the world who is not the result of one sperm and one egg coming together to make a new person, right? And whether we grow up in a loving two-parent family home or whether it's some other complicated situation, the reality is we were created out of relationship. We were made from love, by love, for love. And so we spend our lives seeking out these relationships. We all know deep down it's what we were made for, so we're looking for love. 
We're looking for connection. We're looking for communion. We're looking for friendship, right? These things that we want so desperately. And I think we all know that healthy relationships are not a given. They take a lot of work. It's really difficult to have quality relationships. They need a lot of honesty, a lot of patience, a lot of care, respect from every person involved. If it's just one-sided, it's not a very good relationship. And in the short list of pop culture relationships we just ran through, some of the dysfunction is very apparent. Some of it is very obvious, right? Um, and in the work that I do, giving retreats to middle school and high school students, I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come up to me, a teenager on one of our retreats, and just share their broken heart over a parent relationship or a sibling or a former best friend that they just don't talk to anymore, right? Or an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girlfriend. When... We have these relationships, they require a lot of vulnerability, which means there's a lot of risk. If we put ourselves out there, then there's a really good chance we can get hurt. And a lot of times in our relationships, we hurt ourselves. It's a risk to be loved, and it's a risk to love other people they may not accept or return that love. And in my own life, I've been in a number of very serious relationships. Um, for 31 years, I have been a daughter and a sister. In my life, I've been a best friend to one person for 17 years. We met when we were freshmen in high school. Um, I've been a really good friend to a number of other people in and out of middle school and high school and my young adult life, right? I have been a, gosh, what else? I have to look at the list. Oh, a girlfriend a few times. That happened. Uh, I was a fiance one time. Uh, I have been a wife for almost three years now. I've been a mom for almost as long. I am a cousin. I am a niece. I am a granddaughter, I am an aunt, I'm an in-law, I'm a godmother. Like, that's so many hats for just one person to wear. So many kinds of relationships. And I am not up here trying to tell you that I have lived out these relationships perfectly because I have not, okay? There are a lot of ways that I really struggle and I really fail to love these people who are in my lives. But I know that is something I could do well, something I can do well if I let God help me. Because he invented relationships. He is relationship, right? And so if we have his help in our lives, then we can have great relationships too. He's the key to having it. And the bottom line in all of our relationships is charity. The greatest commandment when Jesus was asked is love, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. That is the greatest commandment. And loving our neighbor as ourself can be a really difficult thing if we don't love ourselves well. And then we only love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves, and well, we're not really going to love our neighbor well, right? And we talked about loving ourselves well earlier today in our men's and women's session. We have that fuel. Once we can recognize and appreciate the good things that God put into us, then that love from him will flow out of us into our relationships with other people, our families, our friends, the people that we might date. We, we rely on God as the source of love. We receive everything we need to love others well. We can love like he does, with mercy, with joy, with peace, with friendship, with real communion. That's how he loves us, and that's how we can love other people. So what does that look like practically? All right, well, it's not easy to do, but good news, nothing is impossible with God. All right, so if we lean on him for his help, the first thing we can really try to do is to see other people the way that God sees them, okay? Think about this person in the world that you love the most, who is the person in the world that you love the most? Don't look sideways if they're sitting next to you. That's awkward, okay? Uh, whoever it is that you love the most, that's only a fraction of how much God loves you. And it is very different than how much God loves the person that you love the least. God's love for all of us is perfect, it's complete, it's whole. And if we try to see people the way he does, if we have his eyes for them then it's going to go a long way in helping us love them. It's a big part of why Jesus told us to pray for our enemies. Because prayer can change our hearts and help us to see with God's eyes instead of our own. Next, I would say really try to be your authentic self. On that World Youth Day in Rome in the year 2000, St. Pope John Paul II, remember, saint and pope, smart guy, all right, he urged us. You hear that? That's for you. Okay, great. Uh, he urged us to shed the masks of a false life. He said it was one of the keys to being happy. Okay, the key to having a really good relationship is being real. <laughs> real friends can laugh and cry and be silly and be serious and be everything in between, right? And I have heard so many of you tell me that your fake friendships are exhausting. 
that you spend so much time and energy trying to be someone you're not just because you think it's what somebody else wants you to be? Because we're striving to fit into whatever group or whatever team or whatever. No, like, here's the thing. If we're hiding behind these masks and we do happen to enter into somebody in a relationship, then they're not really in relationship with us. They're in a relationship with that mask. And as soon as that mask goes away, what's left, right? By trying to be our real selves, we can have real relationships. I would rather be in a relationship where I'm accepted for who I am, and I would rather be out of a relationship where I would be rejected for who I am than to be accepted for someone I'm not. I would rather have that authenticity. That is true in real life, at home, at work, at school, and everywhere in between. And now more than ever, it's true on social media. I think social media is the easiest place in the world to be fake, okay? We are all carefully editing and revising every image and every tweet, trying to maximize our appeal to whatever audience we think is perceived, right? And I don't think most of us are doing it intentionally. It's just kind of a natural thing that what we do, we post our highlight reel, right? These are some of our highlights in our lives, in my family, right? This is what I want to share with the world because it's some of my favorite things about my life, but that doesn't mean it's the whole story. And let's be honest, when we're fake on social media, a lot of times it isn't intentional, but what else is a Finsta for, right? That's what it's for. And I know that many of you here are probably on social media, and maybe you didn't bring your phone this weekend. Maybe your parents or your youth minister made you leave it at home, but when I search our hashtags for this conference, I don't see a lot from you. And I know when I was in high school, early on, before I got brave about sharing my faith with other people, it was really easy for me when I was coming to something like this, and my friends at school would ask me where I was, say, oh, I'm just, I'm just going out of town. I'll be back Sunday, and leave it at that. If you do have your social media here with you this weekend, I want to challenge you to be bold, to be brave, to put it out there that this is where you are and this is what God is doing in your life, right? As we strive to be our authentic selves, we will unintentionally give people permission to do the same. We will help them to be brave in who they are. If we try to spend less time on Snapchat and more time face-to-face, -face, less time on our screens and more time in our homes, then our relationships will improve. And another key to having great relationships with your family, with your friends, with somebody who's cute, has a little potential, you know what I'm saying, all right, is by embracing this virtue of chastity. I want to talk to you about this for a few minutes. It's something I love so much. And maybe you don't know much about the word chastity. Maybe you've never heard that word before, right? Maybe uh, you've heard some really bad chastity talks in your day. I know they're out there, okay? Or maybe you could get up here and give the chastity talk. I don't really know what you know. So not to insult anyone's intelligence, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, I want to give you guys and girls my favorite definition of chastity to make sure we're thinking about it in the same way, okay? Chastity is a virtue, which means a habit of doing the good that's all about respect, that's it. The most basic definition of chastity that I can come up with is that it is a habit of respect. So it's about respect for yourself, for your family, for your friends, for somebody who's cute, has some potential. You know what I'm saying, all right? About respect for your future spouse if you get married one day, your future kids if you have children one day. It's about respect for everybody in your world because it's about respect for sex itself. So someone who's living the virtue of chastity says, look, I recognize that sex is a good thing, okay? It's sacred. It's holy. It's important. It's awesome. So I'm going to treat it with the respect that it deserves. I'm going to save sex and all sexual things for marriage. And if I get married one day, I'm going to keep it in my marriage, okay? But really, it's just all about respect. That's it. Chastity is cool because it's a lifelong virtue. It's for all vocations. So if you get married one day, chastity is for you. If you become a priest or a nun one day, chastity is for you. If you are hashtag forever alone, chastity is for you. All right? It's for all of us, no matter what vocation. I love when they do that. Okay, yeah. It's for all of us, all of us. Because chastity is a lifelong virtue. That means we can start living it now. We can start living chastity today, and we can live it for the rest of our lives. And the earlier in our lives we make a decision for the virtue of chastity, the easier it will be to live it for the rest of our lives in whatever vocation we end up in. Something else that's great about chastity is that it's not just about purity of our bodies. I think by now we've probably all figured it out, right? Sex is, in fact, physical. Duh. Okay, but it's not just about purity of our bodies because you are not just a body. 
I am not just a body. Every single one of us is body, heart, mind, and soul, right? And chastity is about purity in all those areas, body, heart, mind, and soul. So it's not just about what you do or don't do, but it's about what you say, what you watch, what you listen to, the jokes you tell, the jokes you laugh at, the way you engage with social media. About purity in all those areas, body, heart, mind, and soul, which is something I really appreciate because I live in the same world you do, okay? I know we live in a world that acts like sex is no big deal. We live in a world that says, oh, as long as you're in love, it's okay, right? A world that's never surprised to see a Kardashian naked again. Uh, a world where hashtag me too was sadly too popular. I know what our world says about love and sex and dating and relationships, but I, what I know about living the virtue of chastity is that I don't have to hide in my chastity bubble where I only listen to Gregorian chant and shop at the same clothing stores as the Amish, okay? Like, it doesn't have to be that way, okay? But I can tell the difference. When I'm looking at our world, I can tell the difference between the truth of God's plan for sex and our sexuality and the lies of our world that would act like it's no big deal. I can have that purity of not just my body, but my body, my heart, my mind, and my soul. My other favorite thing about chastity is that it is not about the past. Chastity has nothing to do with the past. Chastity is about the present and the future. So anyone at any time can make a decision that they want to live the virtue of chastity and they can live it for the rest of their lives. It's not really about what you've done, where you've been, what you've seen or said or worn or watched. It's not about that. It's about the present and the future. We can live it today. We can live it for the rest of our lives. I love this virtue of chastity. I think a lot of people get confused when it comes to chastity because we live in a world where so much of our sex ed is like the movie Mean Girls, right? Don't have sex because you'll get pregnant and die, okay? <laughs> Whew, yeah, and uh, there is some truth in some of that. There are physical consequences to not living chastity. That's true. That's a lot of what I heard when I was growing up. But remember, we're not just bodies. We're bodies, hearts, minds, and souls. There are emotional and spiritual consequences that are just as real. Things we don't talk about as, um, as much. Things like devalued sex, where sex is no big deal. It's just whatever. Mostly physical relationships. Maybe you have a buddy who disappears after they start dating somebody because it's all about them being alone, right? Jealousy and suspicion, that 24-7 texting, where you at, who you with, what are you doing, you know? Guy flips out because his girlfriend's talking to another guy or vice versa. And that kind of jealousy and suspicion, let me be clear, it's not always a part of sex outside of marriage, okay? But a lot of times you will see it in relationships where things have gotten physical because sex creates a really strong bond between two people. A bond that's a very good thing for marriage. I don't know about y'all, if any of you ever been married, I'm not sure, but it's tough, okay? And having that strong bond keeps a married couple together in good times and bad. God's really smart and he knows what he's doing. But that bond happens anytime a couple has sex, whether they're married or not. And outside of marriage, without the security of that commitment, without the graces of that sacrament, that bond can cause a lot of jealousy, a lot of suspicion. It's not cool. Another consequence is feelings of guilt, regret, and shame because sex outside of marriage is a sin, and when we sin, we feel bad about it. And maybe not right away. I know plenty of people are like, oh, no, I'm good. I'm just living my life. YOLO. Or whatever. All right, and here's what I'll say. At 31, I am married. I have a lot of friends who are married. I have a lot of friends who have chosen chastity, who saved sex for their marriage, and have never heard one of them on their wedding day or any day after look out and be like, yeah, you know, I guess all this is pretty cool, but I don't know. I just... I really wish I would have slept with like 15 other people first. That would have been awesome. No one's ever said that, okay? I don't think anybody's ever going to say that. No one ever regrets chastity. But I have other friends who have made different choices and when they look back on their lives, they go, oh, I wish. Probably because of sexual memories and ghosts. Um, and you know this if you've had any exposure to anything pornographic and who hasn't because we live in a world where porn comes looking for us. That our sexual memories are so strong, those images, they get stuck in our brain, they're so hard to detox from, right? Well, the same is true of our sexual experiences. Just because you break up or don't see that person anymore doesn't mean what happened. The memories go away. They stay with you. They can follow you into your future relationships and haunt them and make them way more complicated than they need to be. All real consequences. But what's so great about chastity, remember, it is not about the past, right? It's about the present and the future. So if we choose chastity, then we'll be free from all those negatives, and we'll actually have the freedom to get the opposite. You'll get the positives instead. So instead of devalued sex, you'll get deep, passionate sex within marriage. And as a married lady, I would just like to say, three kids in three years. Do the math, okay? Uh, was that TMI? I don't care. I'm married. All right. Uh, instead of, uh, I tell you, sex is good. God made it good. Oh, stop. Now I'm blushing. Now I'm blushing. Stop it. Stop it. Okay. 
Instead of mostly physical relationships, you get creative dating. Because it's not about finding time to be alone and do stuff. But it's about going on dates where you can talk and laugh and really have a good time. And creative dating is super helpful when you're trying to live chastity. Because let's be real, there might be some stuff that you're tempted to do, you know, at home, alone. Netflix queued up on the big screen. Things you might be tempted to do in that situation that you're not going to do if you take your date out to, I don't know, McDonald's or IHOP or <laughs> IHOP or... Whatever, yeah. If you did that, you'd probably get arrested, okay? It'd be really awkward. So creative dating, super helpful. Instead of jealousy and suspicion, you get a solid foundation of trust. Because you know this person that you're dating, they're in that habit of respect. And no matter where they're at or who they're with, you know whatever they're doing is respectful of themselves, of you, of everyone around them. You have to worry if they're not by your side 24-7. There's a lot of freedom in that. And instead of guilt, regret, and shame, you get strong self-respect and self-esteem because you know that if somebody wants to date you, it's because they like you. <laughs> they think you're funny and you're cute and you're smart and you're interesting and they just want to know more about that. They're not trying to get something from you or prove anything to their buddies. Not trying to fill some hole in their heart. No, they just actually like you for who you are. But the other reason why chastity increases our confidence is because when you're living chastity, you know that your worth does not hang upon your relationships. Maybe you've seen people like this who go from guy to guy or girl to girl that can't ever be alone. They don't feel good if they're not dating somebody. Yeah, if you're living chastity, you know your worth doesn't come from your love life. Your worth comes from God, and nothing can mess with that. It's a lot of freedom in that. And instead of sexual memories and ghosts, you get healing of past experiences which has nothing to do with who I am or who you are, but everything to do with who God is. It was in our first reading this morning. Jesus says, behold, I make all things new. That's me. That's you. If we've messed up or made mistakes, done or said or seen things we wish we hadn't, God can heal us. He can help us to move forward in real freedom. And I know that these benefits of living chastity are real because I'm experiencing them in my own life, okay? First time I ever heard about chastity, I was in middle school. I think I was in seventh grade. Some lady came to talk to my class, and the gist of the message I took home was, don't have sex until you get married because God says so. And middle school me was like, okay, sure. Uh, and it was when I got into high school that I started to learn so much more about what chastity really means, that it's not just don't have sex, but it's have God's plan for sex and your sexuality, and so I started trying to grow in this virtue of chastity, trying to live it in my own life. And that was really helpful when I had my first boyfriend, which was when I was a sophomore. Uh, so there was a boy that I liked a lot. He was a year older than me. I mentioned him last night. And uh, I'll never forget the way he asked me out. Okay, I know y'all live in the world of the promposal, but it wasn't like that back in the day. Uh, Joe and I were hanging out one night, and this was his speech. Are you ready? It's going to change your life, okay? Um, hey, Rachel. Um, I really like you, and, uh, I think you might like me too. <laughs> so I was just wondering if maybe you would want to, you know, like, like do something sometime. And I said yes, and then we started dating. That's it, okay? <laughs> it's not complicated. You just have to ask. And in person, if you text us, we talk about you behind your back, okay? So... We started going out, and it was in March of my sophomore year of high school, and I'll never forget the time of year because our first date ended up being on a Friday in Lent. And so we were like, what are we going to do for our date in a Friday in Lent? And so we ended up at the fish fry at the parish, which was so not romantic, right? Me, Joe, the Knights of Columbus, nobody wants that, okay? Uh, but... Really, I didn't care. <laughs> I was on a date. And our first kiss was a couple weeks later on um, <laughs> Good Friday. <laughs> Yeah. Me and my friends, we started calling it Good Friday because it's good. And uh, for our one-year anniversary, he actually made me a scrapbook about our relationship. It was called the Rachel and Joe One-Year and Forever Anniversary Book. Ticket stubs, inside jokes, pictures of us. Super cool. Guys, write this down, okay? And we had this awesome relationship. Like I said, we started dating March of my sophomore year of high school, and we broke up in September of my sophomore year of college. So we were together for three and a half years, which I think is pretty good for your first relationship. I'm not sure. It's just my life, okay? But here's what I do know. I know the reason why that relationship was so good. The reason why that relationship lasted for so long is because Joe and I, we had both chosen chastity before we ever knew each other. So we brought that into our relationship. Not sexual memories and ghosts of other people, but just a desire to really love and honor and respect each other. And we did a really good job living this virtue. Not that we were perfect, okay? We weren't perfect because 
he was really cute and I'm really cute. And when two people are cute, you struggle, right? <laughs> Science, okay, yeah. Uh, not that we were perfect, but we did a really good job. And legitimately, the greatest freedom that I've experienced in my life is that when it was time for me and Joe to break up, and the reality is that most of our relationships are going to end, right? Ideally, only one lasts forever person you marry if you get married one day. So when it was time for me and Joe to break up, there was so much freedom in being able to walk away knowing that I hadn't given my whole self away to a person that I don't even know anymore. Joe is a hero to me now because he set the bar so high for every other guy I dated or thought about dating after him. And Joe is a hero to my husband now because he helped me to grow in this virtue of chastity when I was in high school and college that set such a solid foundation for our marriage. Joe is going to be a hero to my kids one day because my kids are never going to be afraid, never going to wonder, never going to worry that their parents' marriage is in trouble because it's built on this rock-solid foundation of our faith, of this virtue of chastity. I don't know how you hear people talk about their exes, but I hope that's how you'd want somebody to talk about you. When you're living the virtue of chastity, you can have no regrets about the dating that you do, but the freedom to move forward and become the person that God is calling you to be, that God made you to be, and it is not about the past. I can't say it enough because the next guy that I dated after college, after Joe, honestly, he didn't know the value of what he had. So he'd had a sexual relationship in college. He had some baggage from that that he brought into our relationship, and I remember the night we sat, we talked about it. He told me where he'd been, and I just looked at him, and I said, well, that's okay. Because you're obviously not that guy anymore. Because I wouldn't date that guy, okay? I wouldn't waste my time on a guy like that, but you've shown me nothing but honor and respect so far. And I have no reason to believe you'll do anything different as long as we're together. And we had chastity in our relationship, and it was so cool because when we were breaking up almost a year later, he looked at me and he said, Rachel, I'm so glad that we dated. Because you taught me a lot about chastity that, that I just didn't know. I believe he is still living chastity now. I hope he will live it for the rest of his life because it is not about the past. It's about the present and the future. And I know that chastity is a really difficult virtue to live, okay? I know how tough it is to live chastity in a world that acts like sex is no big deal. I know how difficult it is to live chastity in a world where we don't have to go looking for porn because porn comes looking for us. I know how tough it is to live chastity when you really love the person that you're dating. I know that. But I also know that it's not love to look at somebody and go, hey, I love you so much, here's some devalued sex. Hey, I love you so much, I want you to feel jealous and suspicious when you don't know where I'm at. No, 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 baby, I love you so much that I hope the memories of what we're doing right now will haunt your future relationships. I hope this shows up in your marriage one day. No. Come on, real love says something totally different. Real love stands in front of all those negatives and says, look, if that's what you really want, I can't stop you from going somewhere else to get it, but you're not going to get it through me. Because I really do love you. And I want you to have the best out of all of your relationships. Real love, respect, and freedom. You guys were made for that. You were created for it. You deserve it. Chastity will help you to get it. So please, don't settle for anything less. Now, I'm sure you have questions. As Sister said at the beginning, that's what we're going to do to wrap up. And so I'm going to invite Sister and Matt to come join me up here. If you have tweeted in a question, if you still need to tweet in a question, go for it. We'll be checking our live updates. Can we give it up for Rachel, man? That was awesome, dude. That's so good. So good. No questions. Okay, All right, y'all, here we go. You ready? Okay, so here's what some of y'all have tweeted to us um, about uh, just the various things. So I'm gonna, I'll just start. Okay, so uh, one of the questions I have is, um, how do I strengthen a friendship that has hit a low point? How do I strengthen a friendship? And I think what Rachel was talking about, charity, she's talking about love, and to love is to will the good of the other, which is what she was talking about. And so for us to receive a friendship, to receive a relationship, which means I have to see them as a gift. I have to be interiorly integrated on that road of holiness and integration myself, and I have to be able to reverence them. And what I give to them is as a free gift, right, as a pure gift, they're not my possession, they're a gift to me, and I reverence them and I give them back to God, okay? But I think you have to understand, like, the, the, like what we talked about before, revelation, friendship, relationships are a two-way street. So if your friend, if you're getting to the point where your friend's not responding, or you're the one who's doing all the work, so to speak, in a relationship, I think if we'd have to be quite honest with ourselves, maybe it's time to have a talk and say like, what's going on, what's happening? 
And then we have to decide, is that really somebody who's really willing to invest in you? Because you do, you do, you do deserve the best. And not everybody's going to be a close friend. So to look at that and say, how is that relationship going? Is it leading you closer to God? Is it giving you life? Is it bringing you freedom? What's the fruit? Mm -hmm. What fruit is the relationship bearing that will tell you very clearly on what kind of friendship it is? And then you get to decide whether it's a friendship you want to keep or not. So, yeah. I have one here that says, what characteristics do you look for in a boyfriend slash girlfriend? How do you know she is the one? Oh, she. So to cover that very in-depthly right here. <laughs> um, here's one thing I would say, and, and I learned a lot from my wife about this. So this is kind of like, you know, looking back after having been married. But my wife made a list, unbeknownst to me, till we got married. <laughs> which was a good thing because it meant, I guess, most of her list worked out. There was one exception. I'm not really a big dog fan. I lo love, love y'all, but... Dogs, I'm not, just not a dog fan. So I didn't measure up to that one, but she made a list. So she was very clear in her mind. And I would say this to anybody that's like looking for qualities. Here's the thing. If we brought a bunch of you up, stay, up on stage and said, give us your qualities. Some of you would say honesty, respect, right? Those are good things. Here's the problem with just the words. That they don't actually tell us when it's happening. So we're not sure if we can measure it. So I would say be even more specific than just honesty. Like never lie to me. Now, it might sound like the same thing to you, but I think it's a little more specific. Okay, so make a list and be specific. On that list, when it says, how do you know she's the one? I would say there should also be some non-negotiables. Like, not just the qualities you're looking for, but if this comes up, they go. <laughs> right? Non-negotiables. Non-negotiables. And if you want to see maybe how your, like, guys going to see how your girlfriend might treat you when you're married, see how she treats her father... And then vice versa. That's not a like end all be all because all relationships have struggles. But the respect begins in the home. And moms and dads are often the first ones that impart those things like respect and truth and honesty to us. So see how their family dynamic works. And then talk about the places you're like, yeah, that dinner table seemed really awkward and uncomfortable. Let's talk about that. Make a list, be specific, and have some non-negotiables. I would say also, uh, when my husband and I were dating, he said that the reason he knew that he wanted to marry me is because he never got tired of hanging out with me. Mm. You know how you have people in your life that even if they're like your best friend, you kind of reach your saturation point and you're like, okay, you can go home now, bye-bye, it's me and Netflix time, okay? <laughs> like, that's real, right? But like, me and my husband, we've never gotten tired of hanging out with each other and that's because our relationship is based on our friendship. If you don't have a good friendship with the person that you're dating, your future marriage is not going to be very good. Our culture tells us that, you know, sex is everything, sex is everything, sex is everything. Well, guess what? The average happily married couple in the United States of America only has sex about 90 total minutes every week, okay? That's the average, right? Some people are above, some people are below, whatever. That's the average. So if you want to be happily married one day, you better have something to do the rest of the week. Right? That's true. Make sure it's based on a real friendship. Make sure you like the person that you're dating. Okay, great. Um, somebody asked, what do you do when your significant other doesn't agree with Catholic beliefs and chastity? There's varying degrees of this, I think. If it's somebody you've just met and you're just getting to know and you've just started dating, this is a great opportunity for you to share with them, hey, this is who I am, this is what I believe, these are the choices I'm making to live my life. And as Matt just said, there are some non-negotiables, right? If you're like, hey, I'm cool with chastity, be aware of two things. Well, that's not really my thing. Okay, bye. Uh, or, well, if that's what you really want, I guess I could do it. Okay, bye. Okay, like it's got to be something that they also want for themselves because if they're just doing it for you, it, it may not last, all right? And that's not to say people can't learn about chastity. Remember, it's not about the past, right? It's about the present and the future. So that's an opportunity to have that conversation and invite them to that virtue. But if it's something that you're constantly going back and forth on, whether it's being Catholic or living chastity or any other thing related to our faith, then you're not setting yourself up for a lifelong friendship with this person. A lifelong marriage, that'll be healthy. So I would just tread lightly at the beginning, and if they're non-negotiables, they're not the one. Uh, somebody asks, can you speak to what vulnerability has to do with good, healthy relationships? And vulnerability is an area where I share myself with you and you share yourself with me. Actually, a relationship can't grow without healthy boundaries of vulnerability. Have you ever had a friend who just won't share anything about their life? 
and you want to know something about them, but they just won't tell you. And they have a, they're a sacred mystery, and you can't pull it out of them, but they just refuse to do so. And so part of me getting to know one another, or us getting to know one another, is the revelation of the heart to each person. That happens in various ways, and I love what Rachel is saying, and I love what Matt is saying about the, solid, the solidity of friendship. Because many times we think about relationships, we automatically go to romantic relationships. But I can't stress it enough, is that part of being in a romantic relationship, which is later on in life, or, or very few relationships in life, is a healthy friendship, of just being a good person, of being an authentic gift to one another. And so just like there's areas of boundaries out of respect for you physically, there's also areas of boundaries and respect for you emotionally as well. Mm -hmm. So have you ever had a friend that you poured your heart out to and they like just look at you and there's crickets and you're like, I'll just be over here. Okay, a little awkward. Okay, you know, where we open our hearts in ways that are just either not appropriate or just way too deep, way too quickly. Okay, so it's really a product of learning like how, the process of revelation and what's appropriate for a relationship. What's appropriate for their marriages is one thing that be appropriate for a different relationship. And so learning how like how do I respect you most deeply? How do I respect myself? Right. And giving a, a, a healthy heart to somebody being appropriately vulnerable, but also having appropriate boundaries as well because boundaries also help heal and save relationships. I, re I remember when I fell in love with my wife, it was that moment that the vulnerability f switch went off. Mm -hmm. And I remember that I cried. You can make a noise there. When I cried, <laughs> thank Aww. you. Now I feel, I cried well, and like, I, felt my, I felt my heart open up. I was like, I'm going there, right? I'm going there. So I think it's very, it's very true when, when sister says that there's boundaries too. I'm not asking that every person you date to get all vulnerable with. You need to know how to guard that spot for your heart. Because I realized once I had gone there with my wife, like that was, that was a turning point for us when I truly, I would say, gave more of myself to her emotionally. And, you know, then the rest is history. We got a bunch of kids and we're married, so... Okay. So what you're saying is you were the Grinch, your heart grew three times that day, and now oh. you have children. Yeah, but there wasn't a movie about it. It was very brief. You know? I'd watch that movie. Okay. All, All right. The beard, really. okay. Somebody asked, uh, heartbreak, how do you deal with it and help others cope mm -hmm. with it as well? Right. Part of being vulnerable, part of risking is heartbreak. That's inevitable. And so when I think back to when I was dating or when friends of mine were dating and things would end, uh, a couple things really helped. One, to focus on the positives, not in a dwelling way of like, I just wish it was like that again, but to focus on those positives and thank God for them. I learned this. I grew this way. I developed, you know, these characteristics that are going to benefit me in the future, right? To be grateful to God for the good that happened, but also to trust in God's plan for the future, right? Okay, because when I broke up with that guy after three and a half years, who I thought I was going to marry, right? You don't date somebody that long if you don't think it's going somewhere, all right? It was able to say, okay, God, this was a great relationship, and you have something better planned for me? Like, I can't wait to see what that looks like. So to trust God with that future, to stay busy and lean on your friends um, are really good ways to move forward and heal. I, I, I've been broken up with. I've broken up with people. And that's the design of dating. Dating is for dumping. <laughs> Things you didn't think you'd hear on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. There you go, right? <laughs> And, and that's not like, that shouldn't be bad news. I'm not saying like you need to do that now. Like I don't all need to go have talks out there and break up. But I'm saying like <laughs> if what Rachel said is you're going to end up with one person, then the design of dating is, is to kind of figure this whole thing out, right? Is, is to find that perfect person that God has intended for you or that perfect vocation that God has intended for you. So it's going to happen, and heartbreak is something that I've had to deal with, my wife and I have had to deal with, and I will tell you that when we got married, we had to talk about our heartbreaks. So just like Rachel said earlier, too, about those conversations with people, you're going to have to talk about your past and your heartbreaks. And I would love to talk about my, my past in a way, too, that would be uh, beneficial for that person that I used to date, but would also be beneficial for my own marriage. Mm -hmm. um, somebody is asking about um, a couple things. They ask about how do you get out of a toxic relationship, okay? And then what do you, about, what do, you do about depression and a friend who's suicidal, Okay. So this is part of us being attentive to the human person. This is why, my dear friends, we must be attentive to one another. If your relationship is toxic, it is time to get out now. Now, okay? So if your partner is hurting you, if they're abusing you, if they're putting you down, if they're taking things from you that are not theirs to take, it's time to get out. 
right? Mm -hmm. That relationship most likely will not get better, and you deserve, you deserve better. And it's difficult at times. I, know, I stayed in a, a number of toxic relationships in my life, horrendously toxic, abusive relationships in my life, because I didn't think I deserved any better. And at the broken part of my heart were these unhealed wounds. Why I was do well, there's always reasons why we do what we do. I was doing what I was doing because I thought I was trash. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was willing to uh, allow authentic love into my life, uh, a huge transformation in my life that happened very slowly over time, that I realized that I'm worth something. So I can tell you as a woman who's been in a really horrible, awful, toxic relationships, my dear friends, men and women, you're worth more, okay? I want to tell you also that part of us being loving one another is to notice when people are not well. If there's a friend in your life that's missing, if there's a friend in your life that doesn't seem well, you know, many times we wait for people to come and talk to us and say, hey, man, I'm suicidal. And that day might happen, and that day might not, and that day might come way too late. So you and I, and our love for each other, and our willingness to will what is good for another, we must look out for one another. We are our brother's keeper. We're in a fellowship, and we love each other. If there's somebody in your life that seems depressed, somebody in your life that's not around, reach out to them and ask them how they are, okay? We're just about out of time, so we have one more question. Uh, it's for all three of us. Yanni or Laurel? <laughs> yeah. Laurel. Yeah, I'd, I'd say Laurel, man. Laurel. Yanni! <laughs> all right. Hey, men and women are different. <laughs> Can we give it up again for Rachel and Matt, please? Thank you. Thank you very much.